Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the third session in our series of Green and Healthy School webinars. My name is Myla Kelly, and I'll be your facilitator for today's call for the series that we're right in the midst of and for an upcoming workshop that I'll talk about in a few minutes. I am... There we go. <laughs> I'm the uh, coordinator of a program called Peaks to Prairies Pollution Prevention Center, which is um, uh, a, a pollution prevention center for EPA's Region 8, which is basically the Dakotas and the Rocky Mountain states. And when I say pollution prevention, we just mean that we work on environmental problems by trying to eliminate or reduce waste and pollutants at the outset of a project rather than through the treatment or disposal of a pollutant at the end of a project. So, for example, moving from a traditional cleaner to a green cleaner is an example of pollution prevention because you're substituting a potentially hazardous product with one that's less harmful to the environment and human health. Uh, we're based in Bozeman, Montana. We're at Montana State University's um, Department of Extension, the Housing and Environmental Health Program. And basically what I do is connect people who have questions with people who have answers on a variety of topics that relate to pollution prevention. And um, healthy schools is one of those topics, and that's why we're all here today, because we care deeply about our children's health. And, um, and we've put this series together with that in mind. We started out with talking about indoor air issues in school um, and why that's so important and about asthma. We moved on to ways that you can improve your indoor air with integrated pest management and green cleaning. Today we're going to talk, talk some more about improving your indoor air through um, eliminating toxic chemicals in your school. And next week we'll talk about reducing your, your energy conservation and waste footprint. And um, we'll wrap it up with trying to get a handle on how to write the best grant application that you possibly can to maybe address some of these issues. So um, all of these presentations that we've already had are posted on our website, tribalp2.org. If you look over on the side there, it's, it's on this registration form, www.tribalp2.org, if you'd like to see those. Um, we're going to wrap this, all of this information together into a one-day workshop format as well. So that will be in Billings, Montana on June 16th. So if, any, if you have anyone who might be interested or if you want to get some more in-depth with, um, with some of these topics, please contact me for more information about attending. The workshop is free. Travel scholarships are, are available. And it will be at the Bighorn Resort in Billings, Montana. So here is my contact information. And again, this will be on the website, on the Tribal P2 website, if you um, don't get a chance to copy it down right now. But my email is myla.kelly at montana.edu. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started here with our presenters. Everyone, um, all of you in the audience are muted. So we can't hear you, but we can interact through the question pane. So if you look on your, um, you should have a little, uh, a little toolbar, a little screen that has a question pane on there. And if you type a question into there, I can see it and read it, and I can get back to you either through, um, I can either answer you through a chat, or I can facilitate asking um, our presenters today. So please do answer, um, su submit your questions as, we, as we're going through the presentation as they come to you, and then I'll feed those to our presenters. And again, our presentations will be posted at tribalp2.org. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. We've got a great lineup today. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Matt Lingenfeld. And Matt is the Chemical Initiative Coordinator at EPA's Region 8, which is um, located in Denver. Thank you, Myla. Yeah. Michelle, could you bring up the first poll question? Okay, we've got a question for you that we'd like you to answer before we start so we can see how you've done uh, with the presentation. So one of the most important first steps to properly manage chemicals is to stock up on chemicals, 
conduct an inventory of chemicals or call the bomb squad. So if you can answer that for us, we'd appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll return to that at the end. <coughs> okay, so in the EPA Region 8, we've been working on, whoops, we've been working on school chemical clean out for about five years now, and we've been able to clean out hazardous chemicals from 88 schools, helping protect schools uh, for about 21,000 students. And our purpose is to ensure that schools are free from hazards associated with mismanaged chemicals. We find that some of our greatest challenges are that we don't have an inventory of chemicals, so we really don't know what is in the school to begin with. Our next biggest challenge is to determine, once we have a list, which chemicals are safe and which ones are unsafe and which ones should be cleaned out. And then finding funding for that clean out is a challenge. In Colorado, they have a number of regulations for chemicals in schools that you can see on the screen. And the other states in Region 8 uh, do not have uh, any regulations for schools per se. Uh, there are a few other states in the United States that have regulations, but most of them do not. So, does your school require a clean out? Well, if it looks like this one, it probably does. This particular school has a lot of paints and tars uh, that needed clean out, and EPA was able to clean out this school. If your school looks like this, it probably needs a clean out also. So we find that there are a lot of schools that have a lot of chemicals, and maybe only 2% of those chemicals are ever used by the school. If they're not commonly used and they're not safe, we maintain that they should be cleaned out. So another thing that we like to see is a school-wide assessment because chemicals uh, can be found in a lot of different places in the schools. And this could include closets, shops, art and drama areas, locked areas, laboratories, warehouses, maintenance areas and sheds, and buildings and grounds. So we're going to look at some materials that have been found in schools in EPA Region 8. Uh, here's a one liter can of uh, benzene that was found in a biology laboratory. Uh, this particular container has never been opened and it was kept with the acids and the container was starting to degrade. Uh, you can tell by the rust, it's a steel container and uh, eventually this would have leaked. Benzene is a carcinogenic compound that uh, could potentially cause cancer and so uh, we don't feel it's appropriate for benzene to be in any school. There are many chemicals that we find in schools that we don't believe uh, should be in the schools. And uh, this particular box of chemicals was kept by a teacher. Uh, the teacher kept uh, all of the chemicals that they considered to be highly toxic or bad in one box. And potassium cyanide was kept right next to an acid. And um, if these two were to combine, it would create hydrogen cyanide gas, which could be deadly. In this particular school, there's a, a Gatorade bottle that's full of mercury. There's 21 pounds of mercury in that Gatorade bottle in the corner. And uh, it's likely that uh, there was mercury vapor that was coming from uh, this bottle, and the students were sitting about 20 feet away from this storage area. And here's another uh, chemical that was found in a school in Region 8. This is hydrofluoric acid. This is a very strong acid. 
if you were to get it on your skin, it would it would uh, burn you and uh, could get into your bones and uh, could cause quite a bit of trouble. And it's not it's another chemical that should never be found in a school. And here's here's some additional chemicals. Uh, maybe in smaller amounts they might be okay, but not in this large of an amount. So the phosphorus here is packed in water. If that water were to evaporate or leak out, uh, the phosphorus would oxidize and would burn, and that could cause severe burns or a fire. And in the other container, there's potassium metal that's packed in oil. And if water were to get in touch with that potassium metal, it, it would uh, also rapidly oxidize and potentially uh, cause burns. And in this particular school, uh, we found quite a few radioactive materials that, again, uh, probably should not be in that school. And here's another circumstance where we found incompatible materials in a flammable cabinet. Sometimes people uh, mistake oxidizers for flammable materials. And there's quite a few flammable chemicals uh, like paint thinner and uh, ethanol and methanol in this flammable contain container, as there should be. But there's also, on the top shelf, there's fireworks and there's uh, actual black powder uh, cord on the top. So if, if this were to, to, to light up, it would it could potentially cause a big fire in the school. Also in the middle cabinet is something called the thermite reaction, whereas if uh, these two materials get together with an ignition source, it can be used to weld steel together and can actually be used to weld steel under water and is used in the, in the ocean at times to weld uh, steel together. So, you know, those oxidizing materials should not be in there in a flammable cabinet. Here we've got a lot of acids, and there's off to the left there's a base. So bases and acids should not be stored together in the same cabinet. If they were to be mixed together, it could potentially uh, cause a lot of heat and some spattering and, and maybe get into a student's eye. Here's some nitric acid with uh, crystals forming on the lid. And again, that's, that's not a good circumstance. It's hard to handle that without some form of an exposure. And the nitric acid is uh, exposed to the air so that students might be breathing that acid in. Here's potassium hydroxide that has oozed out of uh, the containers. And this is not an appropriate way to store this material. And if a student were to touch this material and rub their eye, they could possibly burn their eye or their skin. Here we've got uh, formaldehyde. Uh, in these different containers, you see there, there's different critters that are stored in formaldehyde. And some of that has leaked out of the container. And uh, this was in a school in Montana. And as the sun shone through the, the windows in the springtime, when it started to heat up, this formaldehyde odor started wafting through the classroom. And the students had to leave. and uh, someone had to be called in to clean up the school. And also another thing that we find commonly is unknown materials, which it's, it's hard to know what sort of danger you're dealing with there. But also unknown should not be in the school either. So it's also common to find uh, leaded materials that are used as glazes in art classrooms. And here's some methanol, which is a toxic material uh, that, that is an old uh, duplicating fluid uh, from some sort of a printing operation in the past that is just sitting there on the shelf and uh, you know, could be a potential fire hazard. Here's some xylene that's uh, used by the maintenance personnel to clean the floor or strip the floor. And uh, it's not something that should be used while the children are in school. And maybe a greener chemical could be used other than xylene. So what do I do once I've decided 
to remove chemicals from my school. The best thing to do first is to complete a chemical inventory and determine those chemicals that should be properly disposed and provide that information. Uh, here's, an, here's an inventory sheet that can be used. Uh, if, you're, if you want uh, an inventory sheet that's uh, nice and easy to use that you can handwrite on or use electronically, contact me and I'll email you a list. So here's an example of some different chemicals and how they would be listed. And then you would send this to a, a waste broker and we can help you find those people. And they can get you a, a cost estimate for what it might take to properly dispose of these materials. We do recommend that you get three bids and make sure that the people that you're working with are capable. So once you've decided to clean out your school and you found the funding and you found the appropriate waste broker and you have a contract, if they're doing it right, they'll come in and they'll pack these materials by hazard class. Uh, like for instance, all of the inorganic acids will be put in one container and packed in vermiculite and then a lid put on it and then it would be shipped off to a hazardous waste treatment storage and disposal facility for proper disposal. And here's a, a common uh, clean out and the different uh, materials that have been put by category into different drums and pails for shipment to a uh, treatment storage and disposal facility. So I mentioned earlier that it's not likely that your school is regulated. However, if hazardous waste is involved, by EPA's definition, uh, it is possible that your school might be regulated by hazardous waste regulations. So that's why you want to involve a, a waste broker or contact your state or EPA for help uh, to work through those regulatory hurdles. So our goals for your school are to remove hazardous chemicals to help you manage your chemical inventories and promote pollution prevention techniques and best management practices to reduce hazards. So if you have any additional questions, please feel free to call me. And there's my contact information. Now, normally we would uh, pull up our poll question to see how everyone had done. But seeing how uh, everyone got the, the question, I don't think we'll need to bring it back up again. So. With that, uh, we'll move on to the next subject and the next poll question. So Michelle, could you pull up the poll question for the PCBs? OK, thank you. OK, so the next question we have for you on PCBs is, what are the two most common sources of PCBs in schools? Roofing and siding materials, lunch trays and plastic milk containers, or caulk and light ballast? So if you could answer that for us, we'd appreciate it. OK, great. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to move on to my PCB presentation. And I've got my contact information on the front page if you have any questions. And at the end, I'll have contact information for a, a PCB expert at the end. So PCBs are an organic uh, compound, an organic molecule. and uh, they're an oil that uh, they're a man-made compound. And it was made uh, for purposes of uh, heat resistance. And it was found to be very useful uh, around transformers to, to cool. And so a lot of PCBs were used for different electrical 
uh, purposes. Looks like it's jumping forward on me. Okay. So, unfortunately, PCBs have been able to get into the environment, and humans have been exposed to PCBs as well as other uh, animals and wildlife. And it's common for humans to be exposed to PCBs through eating fish. And uh, PCBs uh, get into our food chain and they bioaccumulate. And they can be found especially in fish, meat, milk, and eggs. So here's an example of how PCBs are biomagnified in the food web. And you can see the little red dots on the different organisms and animals indicate uh, the higher it goes up the food chain, uh, the more concentrated the PCBs are. So you can see that the orca has uh, some of the highest uh, PCB levels. So for humans, some of the potential health effects are immune deficiencies, reproductive or nervous system difficulties, and increased risk of cancer. So EPA has found through studies that PCBs are, are of a concern in a health environment. And we have since learned that there are PCBs in schools. And uh, the concentration can be at a level that is of a concern. So PCBs were found in cock in schools that have been built or renovated between 1950 and 1978. And PCBs are, have also been found in light ballast manufactured before 1979. So uh, we definitely would like to see schools remove any PCBs that they might find in their school. And we also want to point out that it can be a major and expensive undertaking. So we're going to talk about caulk in schools first. So here's an example of, of caulk in a school uh, that may or may not have uh, PCBs associated with it. Here's another example. Uh, caulk, the caulk is quite often used in the cracks. Uh, the PCBs were mixed into the caulk and uh, made, made for a very strong, a very resilient caulking material. And here, again, at this school, you can see where some caulk has been used on the outside of that school. So if there was caulk in the PCBs, it's possible that it could migrate into the adjoining materials like concrete or brick. So how can you tell if you have PCBs in your school in your caulk? You can't tell by looking, and there is no simple test. A sample has to be collected and analyzed uh, using EPA method, solid waste method 846-8082. And the cost is about $100. So I want to point out that at this point in time, sampling and analysis is not required. And it's best done by professionals. <laughs> so what should you do if you find out that you have caulk in your school that contains PCBs. Well, if you know that it has PCBs that are greater than 50 parts per million, uh, you are required to clean that up. So uh, that's if that were to happen, we would want you to, to contact us and work with us. And also, if the adjoining materials contains PCBs, that may also require be required to be removed. If the PCBs in the caulk has less than 50 parts per million, it is allowed to remain in place. So whether or not you know uh, if you have PCBs in your school, there are some steps that you can do to reduce exposure to students and staff. And those are listed here. That it, and they include cleaning air ducts, improving ventilation, cleaning frequently to reduce dust, cleaning surfaces, not using dry booms or dusters, and using vacuums with high efficiency particulate air filters. So if you do remove caulk, it's best not to leave it on the grounds of the school. 
and uh, caulk that's less than 50 parts per million does not have to be removed, but it may still present a health hazard. So now we're going to move on to fluorescent light ballasts. This is what they look like. And uh, if you do find that you have PCB light ballasts, we think it's a good idea to have them removed because they, they can overheat and melt and uh, the PCBs can drip uh, down into the classroom or, or to the various rooms in the school. And uh, sorry, I'm going to go back here. You are allowed to dispose of these in a landfill if the landfill will accept it. The state uh, may not accept that. And again, that's something that we would like to see you uh, give us a call on when you get to that point. We don't recommend that you uh, dispose of the ballast in a landfill. We recommend that uh, they be disposed of in the same manner as I showed for school chemical cleanout. And then there's a, there's a caveat. If you do dispose of them in a landfill, there could be a liability uh, if the landfill finds out at a later time that they have been disposed in the landfill, uh, they can come back uh, on you using uh, Superfund regulations. So, you know, it's not something that we recommend. We just want to point out that it, it can be done. There are other sources of PCBs in schools. Potential sources are paints, carbonless copy paper, transformers, and capacitors. So here's a picture of a transformer. It, it's common for smaller transformers to be located at schools. They're often on a light pole, uh, maybe near the property boundary. And here's an example of some capacitors. So if uh, you want further information, here's some web links that you can use to gather more information. And if you do have any questions, we recommend that you give us a call. And here's uh, the number for our PCB expert here at Region 8. So with that, can we move back to the poll question, Michelle? OK, so here's the same question that we asked earlier. We're uh, going to test you and see how you did, see if you learned something. So if you could answer this question again. The two most common sources of PCBs in schools are roofing and siding materials, lunch trays and plastic milk containers, caulk and light ballast. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So with that, we're going to move on to, to Jim. And Before we move on to the next um, presenter, can I um, get you to answer a couple questions? Oh, sure. Um, how do you find someone to test caulk samples for PCBs? Do you just look them up in the phone book, or <laughs> is there a database of people that are certified? Do they have to be certified? Well, the you know, if you contact us, we can uh, find a list for you and provide you with that information. Uh, Dan uh, Bench would have a list of those people that can do that. But, uh, you know, there are quite a few environmental laboratories that can do that type of work as well as environmental consultants. But I, I would recommend that you con maybe contact Dan Bench and ask him for a list of names of people in your area that are capable of doing that. And one other question was um, whether transformers or capacitors that you were showing, whether they continue, even those that are um, put in today, whether they continue to contain PCBs? It is possible if one is installed today that, that some old oil is used, but that's usually not the case. If it's a new transformer or a new capacitor, it likely does not have PCBs in it. But there are a lot of older PCBs uh, containing transformers and capacitors uh, that are out there that are still in use. And they are allowed to be used. They just can't make uh, PCBs for that use anymore. Okay. 
Okay, well, great. Thanks, Matt. And if anybody else has any questions, as, um, as we go along, please do um, type those into your question pane, and Matt will be with us until the end so, um, so we can continue um, to hear from him. And so with that, we will um, go ahead and move on to our next presenter, who um, is Jim Malley. He is the Lead and Asbestos Inspector for, um, again, for EPA's Region 8, which is, um, and he, he, I believe, is also based in Denver, and he is going to join us in just a moment. Thank you, Myla. Thank you. I think we want to look at some, uh, or a, at least one question on lead-based paint. The question is, the cutoff date, that means the oldest date built for a child-occupied facility not covered by the RP rule is 1986, 1978, 1985 or 1977. All right, well, my name is Jim Maley. I'm an inspector with the EPA. I do inspections for lead and lead-based paint and uh, asbestos. And we're going to talk about lead-based paint in schools. Uh, why are we concerned about lead? Well, lead is dangerous to children, especially children under six. Uh, children under six tend to crawl around on the floor, get dust on their hands, and then put their hands in their mouths. Um, how is lead dangerous? It affects a child's central nervous system. It reduces a child's IQ and once that happens, it's for the rest of their lives. So that causes behavioral problems all the way through adulthood. Um, other symptoms of uh, lead poisoning are hearing, um, hearing problems, kidney damage, slowed body growth, aggressive behavior, anemia, constipation, difficulty sleeping, there's all kinds of problems it can cause. And how are kids exposed? They're exposed to lead dust. Um, deteriorating lead-based paint causes lead dust. Um, lead-based paint on the outside of a building chips off, gets into the soil and the soil becomes contaminated. And the last way is home renovations or renovations where you disturb paint in a pre-78 building. So the EPA came out with a new rule last April, uh, or actually April of 2010, and it talks about lead-based paint hazards target housing and child occupied facilities. I'm going to um, define those. First of all, RRP stands for Renovate, Repair, and Paint Regulation, also referred to as Renovate Right. Uh, target housing is any housing built prior to 1978. And a child-occupied facility is a facility where children under six regularly visit. Uh, that means if you have a kindergarten and it's in a building built before 1978, this rule applies to your school. And who exactly is uh, affected by the regulation? It's the school maintenance workers and or the contractors that the school hires. And what does the rule say? It says in schools, maintenance persons that disturb painted surfaces must work for a certified em employer. That means the school must send a check and a, and a, a 
some paperwork off to Washington and become certified. They must have trained workers, one of which must take the certified EPA RRP training, eight-hour training. Um, the rest of the workers need to be trained by that person after he's got his uh, certified training. Uh, they must post signs and keep records and, and also work in a safe, lead-safe manner. <coughs> there are some exclusions to uh, to the rule. Homes built in 78 or later, um, housing for the elderly. Uh, basically, if you're in a school, a pre-78 school, and you have no children under six, then you would be exempt from this rule. Also, if you're disturbing less than six square feet of painted surface inside or 20 square feet of painted surface outside of a building. The EPA can enforce some penalties if, if you're found in, to be noncompliant. It's $37,500 for each violation per day. Um, in addition to that, if a child became poisoned, uh, the, and the parents sued the school, the school could be uh, liable for, for millions. For more information, uh, you can get a hold of me at, by email or, or my telephone number is there. And that's the end of that. I guess we want to see the... the uh, poll question again. The question again is the cutoff date, the oldest date built for a child occupied facility not covered by the RRP rule is 1986, 1978, 1985, or 1977. Oh, I guess I did a good job. Everybody got it right now. Okay, I guess, um, oh, there it is already. All right, the poll question is, asbestos is dangerous even when it has not been disturbed, true or false? And again, my name is Jim Maley. I'm an asbestos and lead inspector for the EPA. And we're going to talk about uh, asbestos awareness training in schools. Um, what we're going to talk about is what is asbestos. Uh, you're going to see a little video on how um, asbestos gets into the body and, and uh, a little bit about the health effects, identification of asbestos building materials, and the uh, applicable re regulations. What is asbestos? It's a natural occurring mineral. It's a metamorphic rock. And it was added to a lot of building materials to add strength or soundproofing or fireproofing. It has a lot of good properties. Um, in fact, they haven't found a, a lot of other materials that work as good as it does. We're going to see a little video here that shows how asbestos affects the lungs. Um, 
I think it might take a few seconds, so I'm going to explain that BC. Oh, it's starting already. All right. Interesting to note that uh, that video was made in British Columbia, and one of the largest asbestos mines is in Quebec, Canada. Um, the people in Quebec seem to think that asbestos is fine. We're going to talk a little bit about asbestos health effects. Asbestos is a problem when it is disturbed and fibers are released into the air. Fibers are very small, uh, one hundredth the size of a human hair. Because of that, they can float around in the air for days. <coughs> um, a regular dust mask will not protect you against asbestos fibers. They go right through the dust mask. There are three main health effects that asbestos causes, asbestosis, lung cancer, and mesothelioma. Uh, each of those has a long latency period from ranging from 15 to 40 years. A latency period is the time it takes from the time you're exposed to uh, you come down with the symptoms. The first one we'll talk about is asbestosis. It's not a cancer, it's a fibrotic scarring of the lungs. Um, it can be fatal and sometimes it causes heart problems because it makes your heart work a lot harder to get the same amount of oxygen to, to into the blood. And it's most common to workers who have high exposure over many years. Uh, lung cancer is the second health effect. Um, it's a persistent cough, chest pain, wheezing. It's a slow, painful death. Um, latency period of 30 years. Um, and it also, the, it's an increased risk with smoking, uh, 50 to 90 percent, and I'll explain why. Normally you would think that um, with a increased risk of exposure to asbestos, that would increase your chances of lung cancer 5% and maybe 10% if you smoke. 
You would think that would add together and become 15%, but it doesn't. It multiplies. The reason for that is smoking anesthetizes the cilia in your breathing passages. Um, cilia is what tries to or attempts to uh, keep foreign material out of your lungs. Mesothelia is mesothelioma is the third uh, disease. It uh, symptoms are shortness of breath, chest pain, fluid in the chest cavity. Its prognosis is generally a quick, painful death. It has a long latency period of 30 years or more. There have been some famous people uh, died from that. Um, Steve McQueen, the actor, died in the 80s. Um, Warren Zevon, a uh, rock musician, just recently died in the last couple of years. They never did figure out where he was exposed. Um, Merlin Olson, the football player and uh, actor, also recently died. They think he was exposed when he worked construction. There are two classes of asbestos-containing building materials, friable and non-friable. I'll explain what friable is. <coughs> it's a material that can be crushed up in your hand. These are ex uh, exceedingly dangerous because they can be so easily broken up. There are also three main types of thermal uh, asbestos-containing building materials, thermal system insulation, surfacing materials, and everything else is put into miscellaneous. Thermal system insulation is the insulation on pipes and boilers and ducts. It includes the elbow and joint muddings and can be subject to significant damage because they're usually friable. Here's a picture of uh, some TSI on a damaged TSI on a pipe. This is a picture of what we call air cell. It looks like cardboard from the end, and it's about 70 to 80 percent asbestos. Here's an example of how easily these TSI can be damaged. Uh, here's a, uh, another picture of some asbestos rope on a on a door to a boiler. And now we're going to talk a little bit about surfacing materials. Surfacing materials are materials that were sprayed on and tr or troweled on. Um, they were first the first to be banned because it was so dangerous for the people applying them. Uh, they were good for condensation control, acoustical insulation, fireproofing, decoration, and we're going to look at some examples of that. Popcorn ceiling is one probably everybody has seen. <coughs> if you look at the picture on the right, the, the person wearing the uh, dust mask is probably not alive if that picture was taken before 1973 because the fibers are so small, they would go right through a test mask. If a picture was taken after 73, then uh, asbestos was banned in these products, and he's probably OK. Some more pictures of, of uh, spray-on insulation or whatever. And now we're going to go into miscellaneous uh, floor and ceiling tiles and the glue that holds them on, gaskets, mastic, plaster, wallboard, uh, cement products have asbestos in them, fabrics such as stage curtains, uh, it says here are not ACBM, are not asbestos containing building materials as far as the AHERA rules for asbestos are concerned, but they still could 
contain asbestos. Uh, roofing, mastic, and siding are not covered under the uh, HERA rule for asbestos in schools either, because only because they're on the outside of the building. They still can't contain asbestos. Here's some nine-inch floor, floor tiles, um, nine old nine-inch floor, nine floor tiles always contain asbestos. Um, Twelve-inch floor tiles may or may not. There's a picture of some uh, asbestos paneling. Drywall could have asbestos in it, or the joint compound could have asbestos in it. The last time I bought joint compound, um, it said on the container, does not contain asbestos. Today, you can go out and buy building materials with asbestos in it, and it's not necessarily labeled as such. It may say it contains Canadian mineral fiber or may not say anything about it. Uh, there is uh, some uh, asbestos siding on that on that house. Ceiling paneling or the glue that holds it on and there's a patch with asbestos in it. Recognizing damage to asbestos containing building materials. Look for holes, rips, water stains, and abrasion. Remember that asbestos fibers are small. They can float in the air for days. So every school needs to know where the asbestos is in their school and always respond to any visual damage. Here's some pictures of damaged asbestos in schools that we've found in Montana. There's a boiler. Hopefully these have all been cleaned up by now. Uh, this one I heard was uh, uh, an electrician went in there to do some work and had to cut through that and didn't even know it was asbestos. A little bit about the regulations, the O'Hara rule. It applies to all public and private nonprofit schools. It requires inspections every three years, training, notifications, labels, a designated person, and a management plan. Even if the school is, is asbestos free, you're still required to have a designated person. This person is the only person that can prevent the reintroduction of asbestos into the school. A little bit about a HERA training. Um, a designated person is required to have some training and we have a self-training manual. Once that person reads through the manual, he can actually give the two-hour asbestos awareness training to the rest of the, or to all of the custodial and maintenance people. Um, custodial maintenance people are required to have this training once, according to the EPA, but OSHA requires it yearly. Um, the two-hour asbestos awareness training allows people to work around asbestos, not on asbestos. If you need to work on asbestos to do small jobs, uh, you're required to take the 14-hour training. Another law that pertains to asbestos in schools and asbestos off the schools um, is called NESHEP, and it deals with the renovation and demolition activities. Um, it requires that all buildings, before you renovate or demolish them, be inspected for asbestos. And that means even if the building was built yesterday. It requires notifications, notification to uh, the EPA if it's on tribal lands and to the state that you're in if it's not on tribal lands. It requires proper methods and proper disposal of the friable asbestos. Contact information, uh, if you're in 
Montana, contact me. There's my telephone number and email address if you're in some other state in the in the um, region eight contact Chris and that's the end of that I guess we want to look at the all right the question again is asbestos is dangerous even when it has not been disturbed true or false I guess I didn't do a good job on that one. <laughs> the answer is is um, false. If it's not disturbed, it's not really a problem. So that means in a school, if you're not disturbing it, you're not drilling holes in it, you're not sanding it, you're not scraping it, it's not a problem. It is a problem when you are doing any of those things. Jim, I got a couple questions for you if you'll if you'll take them. Um, um, try. <laughs> okay. One is um, is whether um, children are more susceptible to asbestos health concerns than adults. Um, yes. Um, Young children's growing bodies uh, seem to take in lead more readily than adults. Also, children, small children, crawl a lot, get dust on their hands, and are constantly putting their hands in their mouths, so they're exposed more often. And. Okay, great. And um, so sort of a, um, I, I guess, well, another question is, um, why can you buy building materials with asbestos if it was banned in 1973? Um, not everything was banned in 1973. Spray-on materials were banned in 73. I think um, in 89, most new uses were banned in the US. Two years later, 91, the courts overturned that, saying it would put too many people out of work. Sad but true. Hmm. So are products required to be labeled as um, containing asbestos then? No, they are not. The only way to determine if they contain asbestos or not, is to write or call the manufacturer. That seems like a big task. It does. <laughs> I'm, I wish it was some other way. Um, OK, a couple more questions. How do I find out if there is asbestos in my daughter's school? The simplest way is to go to the school and, and request to look at the asbestos management plan. Every school is required to have one, even if they're asbestos free. And it's supposed to be available to the public. So are all schools required to get tested on a regular basis then? All, well, I shouldn't say all schools. All schools that contain asbestos are required to get reinspected every three years. Once they become asbestos free, they don't need to be inspected anymore, but they're still required to have an asbestos management plan. They are required to have the paperwork that um, shows that they're asbestos free. That's supposed to be available to the public. And they still need to um, have a designated person that knows about asbestos to prevent the reintroduction of asbestos into the school. Great. Well, that's all the questions I have. If anybody else has 
anything else that they're wondering about or um, dying to ask these guys, um, please go ahead and do that now. Of course, as I said, all of these presentations will be posted at tribalp2.org. So you can just go to that home page and um, click on, you'll see the icon for today's presentation, Toxic Chemicals in Your School. It won't be up right now, but by tomorrow it should be. Um, go to the icon, the Toxic Chemicals in Your School, School Chemical Cleanout, PCBs, Lead, and Asbestos, and those presentations will be posted. So um, all of those contact information, um, emails and phone numbers, if you didn't get a chance to copy those down, you can go ahead and look at those. And if you want to send any of your colleagues um, to the website to look through the presentations, we also have a recording on there, so they can go ahead and listen to, to what our presenters spoke about today. Um, um, and other than that, we have um, next Tuesday, same time, same place, we have Reducing Your Footprint to Energy Conservation and Waste Reduction. And we hope that you can join us for that and maybe even join us for our workshop in Billings, Montana on June 16th. So let me know if you would uh, like to attend. And with that, we have no further questions. And um, I, oh, I guess I'll just wrap up with one um, last poll question. You guys have all been really patient and great about answering these polling questions. I think they're kind of fun, a good way to create some interaction between our speakers and the audience. And so the last thing we'll ask is whether, um, as a result of any of the information that you've learned in this um, through this webinar today, if any of you intend to take any action on that. So we will ask you that, and um, we hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon and evening. Thank you very much. Myla, that one will come up as they exit the webinar. OK, that one will come up as you <laughs> exit the webinar. So thanks for joining us. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs>